That's what I'm talking about. Hey, tonight, tonight I want to introduce you to one of my heroes. This is my, one of my most valuable brothers in the, in the, in the Big Apple out in New York City. My brother Jeremy, man, he, uh, he's a lawyer by trade, but he's a servant of the Most High God by calling. And Jeremy was living, living fat, P-H-A-T. He was living fat in his big dog lawyer lifestyle and until 9-11 hit. He's going to tell you the story, but God recaptured and reconfirmed the calling to him, and he's my hero because he would dare to leave the comforts of corporate America to return to his roots and, and just re-engage the young people in his community. Jeremy Leeds has founded a ministry called Generation Excel that's bringing life and hope to his part of the city and beyond. Jeremy is a co-leader co of a, one of the largest youth ministry networks in all of New York City called The Coalition. Jeremy is also privileged to be teamed up with a, a, a team of leaders, and they, they co-shepherd the uh, youth division of the Billy Graham crusade that's happened in just a few short weeks. Jeremy is a next generation urban leader. Would you give it up for my friend and brother, Mr. Mr. Jeremy Del Rio. I bring you greetings from the capital of the universe. We're not just any apple in the bushel. We're the Big Apple. But I want to remind you that though I might represent the Big Apple in this place, each and every one of you, Scripture tells us, represent the apple of his eye. It is an honor to be with you tonight, not just to have the stage and get to talk to all of you right now, but I am in the company of my heroes. Anybody that is committed to urban youth ministry is a hero of mine. Because people like you, people like me, people like Larry and the folks that he represent, we understand something. And if, if you've never heard it put in quite these terms before, bear with me because we just might explode a couple of myths tonight. But there is a myth in our communities, in our society, that tells us that young people are the future. It's an insidious myth because it sounds so sweet, right? It, it, it aspires to something down the road. That's fine, it, it sounds good. In fact, there's a nugget of truth because like any good youth worker knows, the Bible tells us that God has a plan for us. It's a plan to prosper us and not to harm us. It gives us hope and a future. So there's some truth in that, but I want you to know something. That's not the whole story. Young people have a future, that's true. But young people are the generation of today that hold the future. David was not the future when as a teenage boy, he was the only man in Israel courageous enough to look Goliath in the eyes and say, how dare you defile my God? Mary was not the future when as a virginal teenage girl, God himself impregnated her so that she would give birth to his son. Josiah was not the future when as an eight-year-old boy, he became the king. And Timothy was not the future when Paul said to him, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in faith, in hope, and in purity. That's the generation that it's our privilege to serve. A generation that right now has a calling that none of us can fulfill. None of us as youth workers have the kind of influence that they have, for example, in their schools. None of us have the influence that they have in their homes, among their peers, with their friends, in their communities, hanging out in the parks, in the blocks, 
where they live. Yes, they've got a future, that's true. But they have a present and it's our job to empower that present, to give them a platform, to look at them, not like Saul and say, sure, you can fight Goliath, but wear my armor. When they come to you to say, I want to look Goliath in the eye. Let me, let me at him. Give me a shot to take out Goliath. And we try to fit them into what we're comfortable with. How many know it doesn't fit? The kids that we serve want to confront Goliath with a slingshot and a handful of rocks. And it's our job to give them the platform to do it. Amen? Amen. Well, we're going to change gears. That's not my sermon tonight. I've been asked to talk about a place of hope. Specifically, I've been asked to uh, share the story of the post 9-11 environment in New York from the perspective of a youth worker. That's all I am. I'm a youth guy. And yet, God allowed me, even in my youthfulness, a platform to take on a few Goliaths. So we have a slideshow uh, that's been prepared that's going to set the context for the rest of the message. So if we could all direct our attention back to the screens. Tonight I ask for your prayers for all those who grieve, for the children whose worlds have been shattered, for all whose sense of safety and security has been threatened. And I pray they will be comforted by a power greater than any of us, spoken through the ages in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Our flags were flying, half masked those days. Our people will remember those who passed away beautiful faces and old familiar names there is no way the deaths will be in vain out of the ashes we mark the lessons that we've learned out of the darkness we see the light for which we've yearned arise and stand united all the world will see when all the smoke is clear america will still be here our foundation is our people are praying in humility and faith. We're asking for wisdom and for God to give us grace. Standing for freedom. See the light for which 
September 11th was a defining day for all of us. As you know, the world has not been the same in the last three and a half years with wars, with terrorism, with fears. We saw that little video where young people were talking about how they think about terrorism every day. Can you imagine that? It's not that long ago that kids in high school were not thinking about terroristic attacks. They might have thought about getting, you know, some other kinds of attacks. But planes crashing into buildings was not on their radar any more than it was on yours or mine or the CIA's or the president's or the Defense Department. People weren't thinking in those terms on September 10th. Something happened on September 11th. For me, as a young person, it was a defining day for a lot of reasons. That particular morning, I, I didn't have to be at work uh, until about 10 o'clock, so I was taking my, my, my time, I had the radio on, and the show that I was listening to on the radio was interrupted by a news report of a plane that had hit the tower. And so like many Americans, I ran into the living room, turned on the TV, and stood mesmerized. Now, I'm a lifelong New Yorker. For me, I, I was born after the Trade Center was constructed, so I don't know a skyline that doesn't have those twin towers standing in downtown. So it was surreal. It was like, this, this can't be happening. And then when the second plane hit, it got, you know, it, it looked like a bad movie. And then after the second plane hit, I called my dad. My father has been a lifelong role model a mentor. I want to thank uh, our spoken word poet before for the message that he brought. And in fact, I'm going to ask them to bring the chair back on the stage. We're going to come back to that, but let that be a visual image of the empty chair for a second. But I did not grow up in a fatherless home. Nineteen and a half million young people in our country do grow up without dads. 23 and a half million, in fact, live in homes where they have neither their mother nor their father. We serve a generation of fatherless kids. Well, that's not my testimony. I have a father who's been a role model to me my whole life. When I was eight years old, he literally read Romans 5.20 to mean what it says. Sometimes we read scripture and we dance around what it means. Well, Romans 5.20 says where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. So my dad in his genius interpretation of Romans 5.20 said, well, if grace abounds in the presence of sin, let me find the most sinful parts of New York City and take my kids there to minister. So he went to the NYPD and he said, where are the worst drug spots in New York City? Because that's where I want to go. What do you want to do there? They identified for him two corners. He said, just give me sound permits. Well, what are you going to do with those permits? I'm going to preach Jesus. The police thought he was crazy, but they gave him the permits. My first ministry experience was as an eight-year-old boy alongside my dad in Union Square Park. If any of you visit Manhattan anytime soon, you'll notice that Union Square Park is a gentrified place. It's a yuppified community. It's where rich people go. Well, in 1982, when we started Abounding Grace Ministries, things were a little different at Union Square Park. It was a drug supermarket. My first experience at the park, a drug deal went bad and a guy got stabbed about 30 yards from where we were ministering. And dad brought me the next week. That didn't stop him. So that's just a little perspective on my dad. So when the second plane hit, my instinct was, call my dad. He, he's got to know about this. If he doesn't already, you know, what's he have to say? So I got him on the phone and, and actually I called and I, I got voicemail first and then I got him on the phone later. He was having breakfast in Midtown with a friend of his when the planes hit. And that same instinct that said, if I want to experience God's grace, let me find a lot of sin, said, I've got to get to ground zero. I have no idea what I could possibly offer at ground zero, but somebody's got to be there. In the middle of the death and the destruction, someone's got to be there. So he got on his Harley. He's an unconventional guy, if you haven't already interpreted that. 
He's got tattoos in here. In fact, you saw some pictures of him in the slideshow, but he's got tattoos and rides a big Harley and you know, that's his shtick. Well, a year before 9-11, my dad understands it. If there's one thing he gets, it's that if you're gonna reach people, you've gotta use bait. You know, if you're gonna be a fisher of men, you've gotta go out into the deep with the right bait in order to catch the fish. And so a year prior to 9-11, a ministry friend of his said, you know, do you own a clerical collar? And my dad didn't own a clerical collar. He drives a Harley, you know. What do I have use for a clerical collar? Well, his friend said, you know, you should have one just in case because they're really helpful in an emergency. You put on a clerical collar and you don't have to explain who you are. People make certain assumptions about who you are and, and they open doors for you. So that made sense. He's a fisherman for people. So he went out and he got himself a clerical collar. Never wore it but was prepared just in case. Well, on his way to Ground Zero, which should have taken him about 10 or 15 minutes from where he was in Midtown, the Holy Spirit spoke to his heart and said, go home first. Put on that collar that's hanging out in your closet that you've never touched before. I thank God that he obeyed the still small voice of the Holy Spirit because what happened was the detour home allowed him not to arrive at ground zero until just after the second tower collapsed. And if any of you remember what was going on on 9-11, one of the very first casualties of September 11th documented was Father Michael Judge, who was the chaplain for the fire department. He died even before the first building collapsed. To our knowledge, after Father Judge passed away, my dad, this tattooed, earring-wearing, Harley-riding, thugged-out minister from the projects in the Lower East Side, was the only minister at Ground Zero on September 11th. Now, I'm talking to him just before he got there, and in my mind, I'm thinking, Dad's going to Ground Zero. You know, part of me was like, hooray, dad, do your thing, represent. But part of me was like, are you sick? You know, are you crazy? That's not the place to be on September 11th right now. Everybody's leaving ground zero right now, and you want to get down there? But he's got a mind of his own, and he went. And he was there on September 11th. And he tells the story that literally when he pulled his bike up and got off, because of the collar, he didn't have to explain who he was. And his very, as soon as he got off his motorcycle, took a few steps, a uniformed worker ran to him and said, Father, will you come with me? And he took him to a, a body bag. And he said, will you pray for the body parts? And opportunities to minister began to open up. And he didn't even, he wasn't there to preach. He wasn't there to convert anybody. He wasn't there to have an altar call or conduct a street meeting. He was there not knowing why, except that the Holy Spirit directed him to go and spared his life. And when he came back that night and I talked to him, he was like, Dad, you know, what was going on? What did you do? With tears in his eyes, he said, I really couldn't do a whole lot. All I could do was be a visible presence that God was still in the midst of the, the despair and the destruction. And that offered folks hope. That provided for them a reminder that God was still in control that as much as the world was literally collapsing before their eyes, and not only was it collapsing, but it was taking people out, that God was still in control. Well, on September 12th, I was able to get to ground zero. I, there was like no getting into Manhattan on September 11th, if you weren't already on the island, and I live in Brooklyn. But on September 12th, I had the opportunity to go to Ground Zero. The black and white photos that you saw in the, in the picture were taken by me on September 13th. 
But when I got there on the 12th, it was, it was like a bad movie. I felt like I walked onto a set of a, you know, a B flick, a science fiction flick that nobody would believe if they saw it. The pictures on TV did not capture it. For blocks in every direction, you had that dust and debris and broken stuff. Every, it was like, it was unbelievable. It was absolutely beyond description what was going on. So I, I get down there. Now, I didn't have a clerical collar. I was unprepared for that moment. But I said, let me get down there anyway. The, an opportunity presented itself for clergy to get down there and be a, a source of spiritual comfort to the work, rescue workers and all those guys. And so I went down there. And as I'm walking around trying to figure out what to do, I realized that the point of my being there was not to do anything except to be a presence and to pray. And I remember that, that uh, September 12th, I had the opportunity, I, it was like just crazy what was going on down there, to actually stand on top of what was the North Tower of the Trade Center on, on this debris pile as people were digging and you know calling for buckets and it was incredible and as I was standing there I I didn't know what to do I was trying to be helpful but I was really more in the way than than a help and so I just began to pray and the prayer that God dropped in my heart that day was that buried in the rubble are the seeds of revival that in the midst of the rubble, the desperation, the despair, the depravity, the, the death, the hopelessness were the seeds of something that God was going to do that would blow our minds. And so that's been a rallying cry for me ever since. God, somehow, some way in my city, in my culture, New York City has 8 million residents just in the five boroughs. 20 million in greater New York. There are 2 million young people in my city under the age of 19. 2 million. There are 1.1 million in the public school system of New York City. By itself, that's the 10th largest city in America. Just the public schools in the five boroughs of, of New York have the 10th largest city in America. We have this massive pool to fish in. Unbelievable need, unbelievable desperation. But the body of Christ is fragmented. We don't relate to one another. We're not doing what God has called us to do. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, reads, When Ahaz son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah. Uh, these nations, it doesn't matter the names, marched up to fight against Jerusalem. But they, you know what I'm talking about? All these names that nobody can pronounce in our time. They marched up. They sieged Jerusalem. Jerusalem was under attack. And it wasn't just one nation that had come against them. It was multiple nations. Then verse 2 says... It wasn't just other nations. Now the house of David was told, Aram had allied itself with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ahaz the king and his people were shaken. Not only were they under siege by foreigners, but Ephraim was Israel. Israel had come against Judah. Now if you know Old Testament, you know there had been, there'd been some beef in that house. And so Judah and Israel weren't exactly getting along real well. But you know how it is in family strife. It's one thing to have beef and not talk to somebody. It's another thing to get stabbed in your back by your brother. Well, Jerusalem is under siege and they've been betrayed. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, the prophet, go out you and your son to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool. Say to him, be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of these nations 
who said, let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves and make the son of Tabeel king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says, it will not take place, it will not happen. Jump down to the end of verse nine. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. The, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Isaiah. Guys, it's time for us to recognize our prophetic moments. I'm not talking about the hyper-spiritual kind of prophecy that some traditions exhibit. I'm talking about the kind of prophecy that Ezekiel talked about, the vision where God took him into the valley of dry bones and said, can these bones live? Gave him a trick question. Can they, of course they can't, that would be the obvious answer, but God's asking, so maybe there's something else. And G God said to Ezekiel, prophesy to the bones. Speak life over those bones. Be a counter force in that place of death and desperation. That's the prophetic moment that we've been called to. There are 19 and a half million kids without dads and we saw visually expressed to us the impact that that has, but we didn't need to be reminded. It painted a picture that we're all very well acquainted with. He says, if you don't stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Again, the Lord spoke to the king. Ask the Lord your God for a sign. Isn't it wrong to ask God for signs? Right? Isn't faith about not needing the sign? Well, God said to the king, ask me for a sign. And the king responded in the way that many of us respond. He got super spiritual. Ignoring for a moment the fact that God was giving him a direct instruction, he said, I, I don't need to ask. I'm not gonna put the Lord to a test. He played himself like we play ourselves, confronted with hopelessness. God invites us to ask him for a sign. And what's the sign that he presents? When Isaiah said, here now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of men? Will you try the patience of the Lord also? He read right through the spiritual BS. And he said, don't play me like that. You wanna play yourself, that's fine, but, but I'm gonna give you a sign anyway because I know not only do you need it, but the people need the sign too. And he said, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel. God with us, God with us, present in us. That is the sign in a hopeless situation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we know that Emmanuel came 2,000 years ago, didn't he? The virgin, in fact, conceived and gave birth to Christ. Well, that was great then, but we don't live 2,000 years ago. We're not part of, of the people to which Jesus was sent. He came to seek and to save the lost, but as a Hebrew to the Hebrews. We're not, many of us, some of us might be, most of us aren't. Turn to Colossians chapter one, verse 24. Paul in the New Testament is reflecting on the mystery of God and, and, and all that he is and he says, in verse 24, now I rejoice in what was suffered for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. Verse 25, I have become its servant by the commission of God, commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen, pay attention to this verse, underline it if it isn't already, circle it, star it, do something special to it so you never lose sight of it. He says, to them God has chosen to make known, to who? To the Gentiles. 
God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of the mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We're going to explode another myth for just a second. The place of hope is not a destination. The place of hope is not the place that you invite kids to go to. It's not your youth center. It's not your gymnasium. It's not your church sanctuary. The place of hope is wherever you are. Read it again. To them, to the Gentiles, to the world that inhabits our cities, to the multi-ethnic depiction of heaven that reside in our backyards, to them God has chosen to make known the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We've got a generation of young people who are the fruit of absent dads, whose heart breaks. Why? Because the person who should have protected them, the person who gave life to them, the person whose DNA they carry abandoned them. He's not there for them, to hold them, to embrace them, to tell them how much they mean to him, to share that love with him. And it's that generation to which we've been invited to be the hope of glory. The hope doesn't get communicated through your programs. The hope doesn't get communicated through your spaces. The hope doesn't get communicated through any of our methods or our music or the hip hop or any of that stuff. And I'm not against any of it. If you came to my workshop this afternoon, you'd know that. The hope is made manifest by your presence. By your, you carry it with you. Isaiah uh, chapter 63 is another prophetic moment that foretells this, this son that was born of the virgin, this Emmanuel, what his mission statement would be. Actually, verse chapter 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. You can't preach to an audience that you're not in front of, that you're not engaging with. You can't bind up the brokenhearted if they're not within your grasp. He says, he sent me to proclaim freedom for the captives. Well, you don't need to proclaim freedom for captives if you're outside of the prisons of life. The captives are chained up behind the prisons of life, whether they be literal jails or figurative jails. The loneliness of the child who looks at the seat that dad should occupy, but he doesn't, whose heart is broken. He's a captive to the pain and the hurt, and God invites us to set him free. He says, to release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jump down to verse three, and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. That's the mission statement that Jesus embraced as his own. It's the mission statement that he invites us to embrace as our own. He, in fact, not only does he invite us, but in fact, he sends us out with that commission, with that commandment. The great commission doesn't stand on its own. He didn't just send us out to preach and make disciples and baptize. He also sent us out with the commandment to love him with everything we have and to love our neighbor as ourself. Well, you can't love your neighbor if you're not interacting with him. If you don't show yourself friendly, if you don't open your door and invite them in, how can you love your neighbor if you're not engaging in their life? If you're not present, just as Emmanuel is now present 
in us. This is the place of hope that God invites us to enter into. Not a destination, but a reality that we live. That in the midst of the despair, in the midst of the chaos and the darkness and the weeping and the mourning that represented Ground Zero, there were people there in fact, the rescue team, I heard this, I'm gonna close with this real quick. There were two of these highly trained, sophisticated search and rescue units within the, the emergency services of New York City. They were both on standby when the planes hit. When the first tower came down, the first one was activated. They were in there. The second tower came down, and they were both obliterated. All of the rescue people, the highly trained seek and rescue rescue workers were buried in the rubble of Ground Zero. But there was one other highly trained certified team of rescue workers in New York City. It was run by a, a former EMT in New York City who was a youth worker just like me and you. And this youth worker trying to figure out how he could engage inner city kids who couldn't read, who couldn't write, who were thuggish, who didn't want to do anything, decided to teach them CPR, to create a volunteer service corps in, in the Rockaways, which is a part of Queens in Manhattan. And they got so good at it, some of them actually went through the ranks and got certified to do this search and rescue. So when the planes hit, they were put on standby by the city. When the first tower came down and buried the first team, and the second team, tower came down and buried the second team, and nobody could get into New York City because all the airports were closed, and the harbor was closed, and the railways were closed, and nobody knew what was coming next, and everybody was panicking. There was a team of inner city young people who were certified as rescue workers. And they were activated and, and the, e the emergency services came to where they live in Queens, stuck them on a boat because all the roads and the bridges and everything was closed, stuck them on a boat, ferried them from Queens over to New York. And for the first two days of the search and rescue operation, it was inner city young people who are passionate about Jesus that were going into the rubble to seek and to save that which is lost. They never got to preach, but they were Emmanuel to that place. God is present in this place. God is present. The father who abandoned the child in your youth group may never come back, but you have the opportunity to be present in that life. You and the people that you raise up can be engaged with that life. That's the place of hope that God is calling us to tonight. It's the place that says, that recognizes wherever the foot, the sole of my foot treads. God has promised that to me. The light that came into the world through Jesus now resides inside each one of us. And that light draws people unto him, provides hope in a dark place. When you're in the tunnel of life and you don't know where to go and it's pitch black, everybody looks for the light off in a distance. You are that light. You are the light that draws people to Christ, that offers hope in a hopeless situation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight. Oh Lord, there are so many vacant chairs in our life. Father, there are empty chairs in our youth groups, in our cities, and it's not just the kids who don't have dads in their homes. Father, so many have been so hurt. So many have been so rejected, isolated, made to feel pain, God. They've experienced the fire getting hotter. But Lord, it's the furnace of life. 
Father, I pray that just as you entered the furnace and were a visible presence with Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, that we would be emboldened to enter the furnace of the young people that come across our path. Father, the communities that are destitute, the communities that are too poor to have grits come and perform, Father, that that can't afford to bring in the national spokesperson to come and preach the message. Father, that, that don't have the benefit of the facility, that don't have the gymnasium, that don't have the sanctuary, that don't have the multimedia, that can't put on the show for the kids. Father, I pray that every single one of us in this room would recognize it's not about that. It's about the hope of glory that resides in us. And you've chosen to make us that hope for our people, our communities, the young people that you've called us to serve. Father, I pray that as we leave this conference, we would be emboldened, we would recognize the opportunity, we would be empowered to carry that hope with us wherever we go. That when people see us, they would see a reflection of you. That when people see us, they would recognize that it's not about us. It's about you who who has taken the dry bones of our life and brought life back to that situation. Who's taken the ashes in our own homes and exchanged the ashes for beauty. Father, as we've said yes tonight, I pray we would leave this place hopeful. In Jesus' name, amen.